Greetings and welcome to the second episode of a tutorial series aimed at explaining some of the tools you'll be using while playing Crazy Machines 3. In this episode, we'll be exploring the powerful part editor, which allows users to create their own parts for their machines or to share them on the Steam Workshop. The part editor can be accessed from within the machine editor in one of two ways, by selecting an existing part in the machine and clicking on the edit button, or alternatively, you can start work on a brand new part from within the part catalog by pressing the add new part button. But before we delve into creating our own part, it's important to know what kind of part we need. So let's look at the sample machine I've already put together. As you can see, following on from the previous tutorial episode where we covered the basics of the machine editor, we have a truck, a few boxes and rocks, which are static, and a ball to activate the truck. In this episode, we'll aim to create a part for the truck to use to navigate over the conspicuous rock which blocks the path. So let's head to the part editor and see what we can make. Now, this is where we combine elements to form new parts. And if you've watched my first tutorial on the machine editor, you'll likely already be familiar with many of the buttons in the interface. In fact, only three main buttons function differently. To the bottom left, instead of the part catalog, we can access the element catalog, where you'll find a staggering array of elements, both complex and simple, from which you can design your new parts. In the center of the navigation bar, instead of a play button, this button will instead return us to the machine editor bringing along any part that we might have been working on, ready for us to place into our machine. And in the bottom right, we can see the Properties button. Much as with the machine editor itself, this button allows you to set certain information for the part. However, there are far fewer options for a part versus a whole machine. You can set the name and description, what does the part do, how should it be used, etc. As well as selecting tags and taking a screenshot to serve as the part's thumbnail. Once again, a short checklist at the bottom of the Properties panel will highlight any obvious issues with your new part. Additionally, if you feel the part is useful beyond the specific machine you've built it for, you can add the part to your part catalog, or even share it with the Crazy Machines 3 community through the Steam Workshop. Now, with our machine in mind, let's look at making a part to help move the truck over the rocky obstacle. If simplicity is what you're looking for, then the part need be no more complicated than a single board. There's no need to fill out the part properties information if you don't intend to save the part outside of this machine, so we can simply click the Exit Part Editor button and position this part in the world to act as a ramp. But there's more that can be done with the part editor, and for the sake of this tutorial, we'll look at something a little more interesting. You may have already noticed that in the part editor, there are visible nodes dotted across the surface of any element we drag into play. These allow us to attach elements to each other through joints. To form a joint, simply click and drag an element onto another. The point at which they meet becomes a joint. It's worth noting that you don't need to join two nodes together. We could just as easily force the joint to form anywhere between two elements, but it's often convenient to drag them by one of their nodes as it allows for finer control over the orientation of the elements when they've been joined. Even after elements have been joined in this way, you can still individually modify their scale or orientation as you would have before, and this may well be necessary as joining two elements can sometimes cause them to default to new orientations. Additionally, you can even make specific elements static. Once you're happy with the position and scale of the part, then selecting the element you use to join the two together, that is, the element that you dragged onto the other one, the order in which you do this does matter, then you'll see, in addition to the rotation and scale controls, you'll also have buttons that allow you to change the type of joint connecting the two. In order from top to bottom, the joint styles are Weld, the default connection between two elements, Fix, much like well, this connection forms a solid joint between the two, as though it were screwed together. Ball. This joint allows almost complete freedom of motion for the two elements, restricted only by their shape and how they might collide. Slider. This joint allows for motion along a single path, much like a piston. Axle. As the name might suggest, this joint allows two elements to rotate as though affixed by an axle, useful for things like wheels or windmills. And finally, two hinge joints. As joints themselves cannot be rotated like the elements, these two joints allow you to specify the orientation of the hinge between the two elements you've connected. 
In all cases, a ghost image of the joint will appear between the two elements, depicting the style of joint that you selected, though you may need to zoom in close to see it clearly. For our needs, we'll be using a hinge joint to create a seesaw between the board and an oil barrel, something a little more interactive for our players to work with. But on its own, with no initial force applied to the board, our seesaw will remain perfectly balanced and unlikely to be of use. Adding a hook to one end of the seesaw by a fixed joint, we can create a visual cue for the player. However, as with many elements, the hook has no specific function by itself. First, we need to show the editor how we intend the player to use this part. To do that, we can take the hook spot FX and attach it to the hook itself. This creates a point where the player can affix something to the seesaw. And with that, our new part is complete. Back in the machine, you can see that I've added our new part to the machine, as well as a large balloon. When we run this machine, you can see that the seesaw tips in the wrong direction, thanks to the added weight of the hook. And the balloon rises uselessly, leaving the truck no way to get past. Here, we'll introduce a connection part, the rope, which we can use to join the balloon and the hook. As we want the player to work this out for themselves, we can make the rope a gameplay part, much as we did with the ball. As you can see, the player must now not only position the ball to turn on the truck, but also tether the balloon to the seesaw, in order to rise the opposite end and allow the truck away to cross onto the seesaw and over the rock that was blocking its path. Our new part has performed perfectly. But with that, I'm afraid we've come to the end of this tutorial on the basic uses of the part editor. But there's still much more that can be done in Crazy Machines 3. And in the next tutorial, I'll be looking into the powerful signal wiring tool, as well as the chips and effects that can be used with it to create complex parts and machines. Until next time, take care.
Got a grudge to settle? Enter the trap house and satiate your sadistic desires. Brutalize your buddies across more than 100 levels in six different game modes, like Last Man Standing. Dodge Saw. Dodgeball with a saw. Because dodging a wrench stopped being funny in 2004. Murder Ball. Go head to head to zombie head. Sling a zombie's head through the goal to win. Survive. Work together or alone to endure hordes of monsters for as long as possible. Escape. Be the first to finish or the last to die. Gauntlet. Not for the faint of heart. Trap House. Coming Spring 2016.